Hello, this is the Cretaceous Tertiary uh, Extinction Event Lecture. Uh, it uh, is subtitled, What Really Killed the Dinosaurs and 75% of Life Forms on the Planet. Uh, I'm going to attempt to do this lecture in three parts, um, basically 25 slides each, approximately. Um, this lecture deals with, obviously, the extinction event of the dinosaur uh, about 66.5 million years ago. Um, in order to really get a lot out of this or to really understand this uh, lecture, there are, uh, you know, a few basic uh, geology, there is some geology knowledge that you would need to know, um, at least to really, you know, get a full grasp on what I'm talking about. Um, so in reality, this lecture was designed for people with moderate to advanced uh, geologic knowledge. Um, however, I will do my best to try to explain it in you know, simple terms, because um, it is a fascinating subject. Um, you, know, you ask anybody under the age of 40, and, you know, what killed the dinosaurs, and they're going to point to the sky probably and say, well, you know, it was you know, some sort of an asteroid or a comet or something like that. But, uh, the reality is, it's, it, it is part of that for sure, um, it didn't help, um, but we can also say with, uh, you know, some speculation that maybe it wasn't just that, maybe that was just the, the finishing touch. Um, there may have been other things involved, such as climate change uh, due to the shifting of the continents um, at the time. So anyways, let's get into it. Um, so, uh, as I said, there are some things that we need to know. Um, so, as far as objectives go, we'll uh, just do a little quick review of the geologic time. Um, we will review plate tectonics, um, because in order to really uh, understand this, you need to know plate tectonics. And, you know, I think anybody watching this lecture has a pretty good idea that plates move around on a, uh, on basically a, you know, a plastic slash liquid mantle um, and they crash into each other periodically. Sometimes they even uh, come together to make supercontinents uh, periodically. Um, so these are important things that we need to know about this talk is plate tectonics. Um, in order to break up plates you need to have uh, massive upwellings of, of magma from the mantle um, and we call those large igneous provinces. Uh, they are all over the world, they are throughout geologic time, and they are game changers for our planet. Um, you know, the best way to think of it is the planet gets a boil and it pops. Uh, and when it does, it releases an incredible amount of, of uh, magma, which in turn changes the, uh, you know, puts soot and dust into the atmosphere, uh, you know, immediately, if it's large enough, cooling it, but then eventually causing a runaway greenhouse effect. Um, and they're almost always associated with mass extinction events, so this one is no exception. There are, there is a large igneous province in the form of the Deccan Traps that shows up, um, right around 67 million years ago or so, um, and, uh, it just starts cranking, and, uh, it, it, it definitely appears to have contributed to climate change prior to the impact event um, and maybe uh, a, a, a good scenario is, is a tag team between these two that really caused this and uh, then we're going to look at some dinosaur just a review of them what they are and then you know their dominance of 180 million years um, put that in perspective we've we've been kind of killing it for about two so they've been around 90 times as long um, we talk about the events leading up to it uh, in, in most specifically large-scale volcanism um, then, of course, the impact event, uh, the effects and the consequences of the climate change in conjunction with the impact event, the, the issues that followed, um, and the results of it. Um, and then discuss the two possible uh, culprits contributing to the mass extinction event, uh, which are, you know, um, you know, a lip, large igneous province combined with a, uh, a, a terrestrial impact. I'm sorry, an extraterrestrial impact um, in the form of a uh, of an asteroid or anything, well, something that was you know roughly six to nine miles long and and, and weighed you know just 
ton, hundreds of tons, hundreds of thousands of tons, and just slammed into the earth. Um, and then the recovery, uh, you know, which species didn't make it and which species did, and then some conclusions. Geologic time, this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it. This is the, uh, this is just sort of a clock model. Um, you can divide it into 12 hours or 24. Um, doesn't really matter. Point is, is that it, time is a very long. Um, you know, humans don't even get a, a tick mark on here because they've been around, you know, for like, you know, roughly 200 million years, I mean, 2 million years. And uh, in that time, you know, we were mostly very primitive up until about, you know, maybe 10,000 years ago. So, you know, you're just not going to see anything uh, on this. You know, your dinosaurs are here. They go back to about, I don't know, what do you say? If this was 12 o'clock, this would be 1030 maybe. Um, and then, you know, life basically is in this area right here. And we call this the Phanerozoic uh, time period, uh, life period. And it really kicked off at about 540 million years ago. And really everything that we see today uh, developed within this time. Um, prior, and so what, we'll just call this 10 o'clock on the scale maybe, um, you know, for the most part, you're looking at from, you know, 12.01 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night, um, very, very simple life forms. Uh, life kind of popped out at about, uh, we think around 4 billion years ago. Uh, very, sing, you know, very simple um, single cell organisms. Um, and for, you know, half of time, you know, almost 2 billion years, as we're looking at it, well, yeah, about 2 billion, well, 2.1.8, whatever, 1.75 billion years, you're looking at nothing but single cell organisms. Um, around uh, 2.4 billion years ago, the... Uh, the atmosphere becomes oxygen rich um, and this uh, this oxygen allows cells to actually begin to uh, evolve and um, single cells now become uh, multi-cell um, and you have uh, basically the single cells were referred to as prokaryotes and these are eukaryotes and again for another you know Jesus Another billion years, the, uh, the eukaryotes sort of uh, did their thing and evolved, and then eventually they started actually pairing up, um, you know, stacking themselves more or less like mats, I guess would be the best way to explain that. Um, and then for another billion years or so, the, they began to fo uh, work uh, into forming multicellular life. Uh, and then, um, this would probably be somewhere around the Ediacaran period, um, we actually start to get animal uh, things that begin to look uh, and behave like animals. These these multicell uh, organisms began to make systems, or they began to uh, 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 come together and make you know um, very simple uh, organisms that really they didn't have a head, they didn't have a an anus, they didn't have a they, they were just basically very simple, soft-celled, uh, soft-bodied organisms. Um, that um, began to take shape, and this is about you know six, seven hundred million years ago, um, and then they essentially stayed like that until um, until the Cambrian explosion, and then you're starting to get things that can not only uh, you know they were soft body, but then they began to 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 precipitate calcium and use calcium. Um, and calcium allows you to build shells and bones and, and cartilage and, and that sort of thing. And around 542 million years ago, 541, you have a huge explosion of life. And all the forms that we see today are represented in very in, in their most primitive forms, and they evolve through the Phanerozoic um, until you get to about 250 million years ago, and uh, you know you have um, things that went from uh, you know, multi-cell organisms to things with shells, uh, things with, you know, jellyfish, worms, uh, into uh, fit, primitive fish, jawless fish. The fish began to fall. The fish uh, developed into uh, amphibians. And amphibians went into reptiles. And then, you know, uh, um, at about 252 million years ago, we had things that looked like 
tigers and herding animals uh, and occupying the same niche. But they were they were very they were much more primitive. They looked more like reptiles. They didn't hadn't evolved the hair and the mammalian characteristics we see today. But however, they did have mammalian characteristics. Some of them did, and that's what the ancestors of us mammals became. Um, and then uh, a huge extinction event at, at 251 million years ago, and then the clock is more or less reset. Um, but things fill in quickly because we now have the blueprints, um, and you have the rise of the dinosaurs at about 200 and, eh, 230 million years ago. Um, and those cranked right up through, uh, right up to about 66 million years ago. And then we have another extinction event, and that gave rise to the mammals. So that's time. And this is just another way of looking at it as a 24 hour clock. Dinosaurs, you know, I mean, really, at 11, you know, at, basically this would be 11 o'clock at night than when they showed up, you know. The extinction event is at almost 11 30, 11.40 at night. You know, we are like 11.59 seconds and 11.59, 30 seconds. So we, we just, we're just so, so the majority of time is just really simple life. You know, almost uh, seven-eighths of, of the time period. Um, so, yeah, geologic time is, is incredible. And again, life is right here. This is, and it didn't even get going until about here. So, uh it's not correct correct it just did not get complex until you know until you get to uh you get near uh the you know the devonian time uh, around 360 million years ago things really you know fish began to really diversify and then you get your first plants trying to get on land and what have you and uh and animals trying to make the attempt and you know in the devonian and carboniferous they did um but, you know, that's another story. But just take it, this is what I want you to realize, is that life is very, occupies a small part of Earth history. Uh, well, occupies a large part, but complex life occupies a small part. Um, anyway, this is one of my favorite posters. Um, it really, uh, it has so much information on it. You know, you've got the continent positions, you've got, I believe this is... Uh, polarity um you know shows you what you know the the poles have a tendency to flip so um you know sometimes it's the north to south and sometimes south to south and what have you right now the actually the, the north pole is the south pole um it, it's 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 kind of weird that way um but it, it, it you know it, in the real world of magnets we're actually flipped right now but we're this is what we're we, we know so we call it normal um but anyways the, the polarity of the planet flips uh, periodically and that's shown here and we use the periodic flips to really tell us um, where continents were uh, through magnetics uh, when when the lavas solidify or the magmas you have magnetite or some sort of uh, I mean, sometimes ilmenite but anything that has a, an iron in it will align itself uh, according to the magnetic field prior to to uh, crystallization and we use that to tell where exactly the rocks what latitude the rocks were were, were uh, formed at longitude is a much different complicated matter i won't go into it but let's just say that it has to do with earth essentially has two very large plumes or hot spots uh underneath the crust and they're gigantic they take up half an ocean uh one is sort of in the indian ocean and one is in the pacific the east pacific um and they have distinct characteristics uh, geochemist uh, geochemical uh, properties and we can usually tell oftentimes which is the source is it the one in the Indian is it the one in the Pacific um, and then we can tell you know we can get some sort of longitude but it's it's sparse and sketchy at best but again this chart has everything it's got I believe uh, not sure what that is I can't see it close enough it could be a carbon it could be um, but anyways, it's got that, it's got sea levels, it's got polarity, it's got uh, all sorts of stuff, all the time periods. Um, if this is a carbon, I would have to blow this up. This would tell you the fluctuations of um, the amount of carbon, biological carbon, which is important because it can tell you, um, it can tell you uh, how abundant life is. So, but I have to really blow that up. I can't see it from here, but it's either an oxygen or, or a carbon. Um, change in carbon and as you can see they fluctuate um i thought global temperature was here uh maybe not 
Anyway, that's worth a look. So plate tectonics, um, we have a continent here, we have a continent here, we have ocean crust here, we have a spreading center here, we have a trench here, we have a volcanic arc here, we have a back arc basin. Um, this is how our planet works. We have uh, continents that float on top of uh, ocean or, or, or oceanic crust or co continent, you know, we have... Uh, we have ocean crust and continental crust uh, floating on top of rigid mantle. Um, and the, the, the mantle is hard. It, it supports uh, a lot of our, our you know, uh, uh, it supports our, our, the weight of the crust and the, and the continents. However, continents are lighter, they're more felsic, they have less iron, they have more quartz, so they float. Um, and uh, Ocean crust has a tendency uh, to start off nice and warm, uh, however more dense, and then as it cruises and cools across the oceans, as the spreading center keeps going, um, the opposite side generally uh, of the ocean crust where it's banking up against a continent or an island arc will eventually become old. Sediments from the arc of the continent will get on top of it. It will begin to push down and eventually it will snap and it will begin to subduct. Um, it, however, uh, because um, this is sort of a zero-sum game, if you're subducting something someplace, you need to re replenish it another, and that's why wherever there's a trench, you, ge you generally will have a, mid a, a spreading ridge where a new ocean crust is being created. And, and in, where this ridge, you'll have um, co uh, ocean crust going you know, opposite ways uh, from the center. So here's a mid-ocean ridge, this crust is going this way, this crust is going this way, it is carrying this continent uh, with it, plus the the uh, the lithosphere, plus the oceanic crush, and it is diving down into this trench, and the trench is melting. I mean, the um, the uh, the uh, uh, lithosphere and the crust begin to melt, and they begin to p build island arcs. Um, and then, as the arc is building, it's you know as it's subducting, the sediments get scraped off, you get an accretionary wedge, you also get a back arc basin because as this is pulling, dropping, this is actually being pulled this way, and you have some thin uh, thinning of the crust of here, and this is called a back arc basin. Um, and then the majority of the planet is the mantle. It is a plastic, uh, a malleable substance, uh, you know, very hot uh, magma, but it's, but it's, it's thick, it's plastic, it, 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 it molds, um, and it can move. Um, and then around that, that, that uh, 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 inside the mantle, surrounded by the mantle, is the core. And, and outside, the outer core is, is iron nickel but fluid. And then the inner core is iron nickel but solid. And that is a result of pressure um, keeping the, uh, uh, being so extreme that the inner core cannot melt. Uh, so that's plate tectonics. The Wilson cycle. Well... When continents come together and, and, and break apart, we'll go back to the slide here. Um, when this and this, or this and this, um, basically, eventually this is going to run into this. Uh, and when this runs into this, uh, you're going to have a collision and a mountain range is built. And generally, uh, That is not actually a complete Wilson cycle. That is just subduction. Um, and this would have to actually open back up for it to be a complete. But, but this is part of the Wilson cycle. The, the Wilson cycles over here, really, these two pieces, A and B, were once connected. They ended up uh, be getting split by a mid-ocean ridge. Um, the ridge is pushing both sides away. Well, eventually, these two uh, pieces, th this is going to travel eventually till it comes over to here. And when it finally gets over to here and smashes into this, uh, it's going to eventually stop. It's going to run out of steam, and then this uh, mid-ocean ridge may even get, uh, this will get pulled in. There may be another subduction zone that, fo that, 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 that forms here. And eventually this subduction zone will get pulled underneath here or pulled underneath here, depending if this one starts to subduct. Um, and then once that happens, the ocean will now close. And a Wilson cycle is basically breaking A and B apart, 
and then bringing A and B back together. So think of it that way. Once these, once this stops and these two come back and collide, that will be a complete ocean, uh, a Wilson cycle. So imagine them together, they split, and then they eventually come back together. That is a Wilson cycle. And the Wilson cycle is described, they usually can be on the order of about 500 million years. That was just me making a guess because it seems like it's taken 200 million for the Atlantic Ocean to get to its present position. So given that it might spread for another 50 million, um, you know, it's going to take <clears throat> probably that same amount to come back together again. So that's a 500 million year. Those are big ones. Um, Wilson cycles aren't always gigantic. They don't always are on that magnitude, sometimes in the order of uh, 100 million or 50 million. Um, you know, the, the Red Sea over in... Um, uh, near Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, that's a brand new ocean forming, you know, if that, but it doesn't look like it's going to go too far because I, you know, from what we can tell, the, the, uh, the African continent is probably going to slam right, but, you know, it's going to just push up and close that again. So it might not be a very, could be just a, you know, 20, 30 million year opening and closing real quick, um, but that's still a Wilson cycle. So you can pick any point on here, but as long as you come back to that point, that would be a complete Wilson cycle. Um, so we'll just start here. I'll run you through, um, you know, what what you would be looking at uh, uh, through a Wilson cycle. So today, uh, this is the U.S. East Coast. This is Africa. We got a big fat ocean between, and this would be, this is the Atlantic Ocean today. Ocean spreading ridge. Phase one, phase two. The one side or the other of this um, spreading ridge, or both, are eventually going to get heavy enough. And one of them is going to start subducting under the under under the one of the continents. We actually think, um, if you really want to flip this around, think of this as the east coast now, and you're looking south, and that is Africa. This is the east coast. That is Africa. We think that the off the east coast of the United States, basically from uh, Puerto Rico to uh, to Newfoundland, is going to start to subduct eventually, probably in the next 50 million years, because. It is very cold, it is very old, and it has a ton of sediments from the Appalachian Mountains dumped on it. Um, the other side, the African side, does not. Uh, we took the majority of the mountains when we split. Uh, so we, so the mountains, when they split, all that got dumped off the East Coast. And we can see huge da uh, down warping of it through geophysical uh, studies. So the, imagine Africa looking south. This is the East Coast. We now have volcanoes. And this is going to drag... Um, Africa or whatever's crossing us back into us. Um, and right now you can kind of think of the Andes or the Cascades uh, in this in this position right now. Even though the Atlantic uh, Pacific Ocean is huge, there's still subduction going on. It is closing and we are getting a oceanic crust area going underneath the uh, a continent and this is called the continental arc. Eventually, Africa is going to just make its way over and it is going to slam into us and these are what i call two um uh an unstoppable force hitting an unmovable object and when the continents hit uh they just just they they just blast into each other and there's really no place to go but up or down and so the continent in a sense thickens um and as it, this as it thickens it grows high uh as well and eventually this is going to run out of steam it's just not it's just it's going to reach a point where there's just no more to go and the mountain range will start to sag it will begin to erode uh, right now this is the himalayas and believe it or not the appalachians um at least two times that i can think of have been on the size uh on the have had mountains at the scale of the himalayas um when pangea hit uh, or, and even before that, the Acadian orogeny really pumped mountains in our area, probably upwards of around 25,000 feet. Um, the, how much higher they got with the, the Allegheny uh, orogeny, which was after the Acadian, um, is up to debate. But we know that looking at the roots of the, of the mountains in New England, um, we see very high-end um, metamorphic facies or you know, rocks, minerals, what have you. And they can only be formed about six to eight miles down. Um, so you're looking at something that's been buried very deep. And that's not even the roots. They go down further than that. So um, 
we 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 can infer that we had some very large mountains here at one time, um, and then before that, go back one more Wilson cycle uh, to the Grenville orogeny at one billion years ago. Um, that was a massive continent continent cry, uh, uh, collision, and we do think that that we had Himalaya sized mountains here again. Actually, they weren't here; they were more Vermont up into uh, Quebec, St. Lawrence area. Uh, you know, Ohio, down through Texas, um, Mexico, parts of Mexico, um, all the way up through, uh, you know, central Quebec, um, and up through Greenland. Um, just, just absolutely massive mountains um, when the supercontinent of Rodinia came, came together. Uh, Rodinia was supercontinent prior to uh, Pangaea. Pangaea is about, uh, you know, 300 million um, Rodinia was about uh, about one billion billion uh, rather. Um, if you didn't hear me, uh, so eventually this is going to stop, run out of steam. It's going to start to sag down. Um, as it begins to sag uh, and erode, it becomes lighter, and over time, you actually it begins to start to rebound. And as it begins to rebound, you have a lot of molten material down here that's been kept under the caps from pressure of the overlying mass but once you take this pressure off it's like a coke bottle when you open the cap or you just twist it it be it begins to 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 fizz and bubble and in this case it's what we call decompressional melting and that is going to start uh creating new magmas which are going to start driving themselves up into the crust and right now the Alps, alps of the rockies are kind of like this They've had their heyday, they are on their way down, and they are eroding uh, as, as we speak. Now, eventually, this is going to you know, erode flat into a plain, um, and we see this in central Canada, the Great Plains, um, and the mountains have been you know, brought down. The Appalachians, you know, they could be either here or here. I prefer to think of them as over here because we have already been eroded down to a stable continent by after 100 million years of, of having those mountains built, so that would have put us... You know around the Cretaceous period and they were probably just a you know a, a rolling uh, tableland um, but then about 30 million years ago for one reason or another the Appalachians seem to have been uplifted again and we're not really sure why um, could be slab break off uh, it, it could be a lot of different then slab break off means that a piece of this underneath here breaks off when you take this weight it ends up popping um, so that's a, a lot of work's being done on that right now. And eventually, this is just going to, uh, there's going to be a weakness that's under here somewhere. This isn't really, there really should be an area under here that's sort of eroded a little bit from uh, new magmas. But in any case, this is going to start uh, thinning. It's going, and the less it, 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 the more weight that comes off of it, it's going to start to accelerate uh, decompressional melting. And then this will push up through, and it's going to start to force these two um, pieces of crust aside, and then we end up back here where we started. And in this area right here, this would be the opening of the Atlantic about 200 million years ago. Or we could look at the Red Sea right now and say, well, that's pretty much what's going on there right now. It's just making its way, starting to rip. Now, this can also be caused by two opposing sides, or even one opposing side of oceanic crust that ends up getting, uh, starts subducting. It will start to pull. Um, it will start to pull uh, uh, the, this one one side away from the other, or, or vice versa, or both. So this can be caused by by a few. And, and, and no matter what, the results are the same. Once this starts to thin, you get melting here, and it, and you get faulting, and things start to push their way up. So in order to do that, generally we are usually associated with a large igneous province, um, aka a lip. Um, the lip is, uh, you know, lips are found all over the world. They, uh, you know, these are just lips from the last uh, 300 million years and younger, and you can just see they are everywhere. Camp, these are all associated, all of these red spots around the Atlantic Ocean are associated with the opening of the Atlantic. Um, you got the Siberian traps here. These are just absolutely monsters. Maybe the biggest, some of the biggest we've ever seen in History, this caused the world's largest extinction, or at least we think it did. Um, the one we're talking about down here is the Tacan Traps. Um, they are 66 million years old um, on the subcontinent of India. 
Uh, they also extend out into the, uh, the ocean basin of the Indian Ocean. Um, so anything that's red is essentially a mafic basalt that is, um, you know, it's, it's on the, it's on the, the, uh, the continent. They're, they're erupted on continents. If it's blue, it's erupted onto a plateau or made a plateau in the ocean. And if it's yellow, um, we have what we call felsic lips or silicic lips. Um, these are not as well understood. Um, for whatever reason, though, they do seem to have a tendency to form in continental crust areas. Um, I mean, this is definitely continental crust. This is continental. Um, and this over here, one can make an argument that this is pretty much part of it's it's, it's pretty it's it's it, it, it's very close to being on a continent and, and this is the Australian plate. So New Zealand is is a continent we have you know it, it looks like there could be a continent associated with this area right here. Um, one of these internally are just um, unbelievably uh, huge. This really does not do this justice, but, you know, 40 miles down through the lithosphere, uh, through the crust, through the uh, the mafic crust, you've got this giant mushroom blob of stuff that comes up and injects itself and plants itself into this crust, and it begins to circulate and assimilate and pull things out and separate um, and, and melts the adjacent crust. It begins to con get contaminated, and as it does, heavier stuff comes out, and then it just starts popping up through the crust, through fractures, and it begins to, you know, thin the area, um, and it makes a conduit, or numerous conduits, each one of these are little volcanoes, and these are um, subsurface chambers that have originated from here and have made their way up. Um, now, these can go from Maine to Florida. They can be in the order of thousands of, of, of miles long, so uh, don't think of it as a as, as a St. Helens or, or a Mauna Kea or Mauna Loa or even a Yellowstone. They're so much bigger than that. Um, they, they, they don't even, they, they don't even, uh, Yellowstone would be this, you know, maybe that. You have to understand these are so much bigger. Um, here's a, for instance, so I just outlined um, the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province lip here. Uh, it, it, this is one of the main uh, mechanisms that broke up um, Africa, South America, and North America, and you can see that the lip was just, I mean, this is the center point, and we know that this is where it basically started. And if you bring all the, I mean, it doesn't take up this whole area, but if you, what you do is you bring all these together and you get this giant blob, and that, that is the camp, one of them. They are down through here, here, up here, up here. It, it, it's spread out laterally on both sides. But just a colossal, and, and this caused an extinction event. Um, we think it did. The Triassic Jurassic uh, border um, definitely had a, a, a mass extinction there um, because when this occurred, it just pumped a mass amount of CO2. So it likely warmed the climate and um, kept it warm for most of the Mesozoic period. Evolution of life over the last 4.6 billion years. Um, this is not to scale. Uh, if you notice, this is 541, this is 2500. Um, so it's misleading. It makes you think that, that that this period here is smaller than this. It is not. It is much. It is three quarters. It is. This is a quarter of, of time, and this is three quarters or or more. But in any case, you got your very uh, very uh, simple um, uh, single cell prokaryotes uh, uh, cells. You've got. Um, things starting to go into eukaryote cells in the uh, Proterozoic um, and then, and the pro, and, and then the, the eukaryotes begin to make multicellular living things, um, sponges, uh, algae, uh, bacteria, um, jellyfish start to show up. You got the Ediacrian bi biota. That's a whole other fascinating a group of animals that basically don't, don't really seem to be, they came, went, and they don't seem to have any um, ancestor or, or descendants out of it. Uh, they're very strange. Uh, we think maybe they, they, there's some that look like a trilobite or an arthropod, but not really sure. But they were soft body organisms that came and went right before the uh, the Cambrian border, which essentially what we consider the explosion of life. And that's when all of the present phylums of, of animals and, uh, are, 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 are represented and they begin to diversify. So now you go into the Cambrian, you got 
you know, you, you go from corals and sponges and jellyfish to to uh, trilobites, fish, um, nautiloids. Um, you start to get into plants, algae, uh, bivalves, gastropods, and then things just begin to to to, to to progressively radiate and evolve, and you you know here you've got jawed fishes and uh, uh, insects. You've got your first amphibians in the Devonian. You, now you've got the oil-producing insects, reptiles, uh, and then the Permian. Just you know, really, Permian was just it was it, it, evolution had really done some amazing things. Put us right where we would be about today, except just one cycle before. So we have reptile-like. We have reptiles. We have rept mammal-like reptiles, but we don't really have true mammals. Um, and then they got killed, and then, of course, uh, a few of them made it through the extinction event. And then you've got rise to the first dinosaurs, pine trees, uh, the first mammals, ocean-living reptiles. Um, and then, of course, the dinosaurs just flourish during this period because it's warm, um, and they love the heat. Uh, and and then, then they get their turn at, at 66 million years ago, which is what we're talking about. And that gives rise to the mammals. Uh, dominant species, the last three billion years, yeah, for a long time it was soft bodied. Then you got trilobites, nautiloids, scorpions, fish, amphibians, reptiles. It, it's, this is really evolution's chain right there. Simple, and you just get more and more complex as time goes on. Uh, these are just a couple slides of the uh, family tree of synapsins. We are synapsins, by the way. I've always told people that we are much more closer related to any. Uh, uh, we're related to Dimetrodons um, than we are dinosaurs because the Dimetrodon is in our family tree. Um, it, you have our, our common ancestor, early reptile, uh, which probably evolved from an amphibian. Um, and you, there's a break right here. You either are a synapsid or you're a sauropsid. And sauropsids are obviously reptilian. Uh, and then the synapsids, uh, these have two, I believe, two openings in the head. And the synapsids are three, which is mammalian, and and believe it or not, and also different different type of teeth. That's one of the most important things for mammals. Um, and this animal, even though it looks like a dinosaur, um, it is not as a dimetrodon, plachiosaur, uh, uh, um, but it was on its way. It had different type teeth. It was an apex predator. Um, it had a lot of mammalian traits, but it 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 essentially looked like a reptile. And it's through this chain right here that, that we started to develop and you, be, you get into therapsids um, and then you go on and you, be, you create mammals right around this time right in here. That's when the uh, mammals first up. But the sauropsids, the reptiles, they, they diversified uh, quickly around 250 million years ago uh, after the extinction event. And you got your dinosaurs, um, you got your, you got your, you got all your reptiles represented here, and all of these, for the most part, made it, with the exception of the dinosaurs. So, thecodonts, therapsids. Thecodont is the reptile, and therapsid is the uh, the mammal version. So, this is where we split right here. <clears throat> we did not split from here until up in here somewhere. Dinosaurs. Diversified group of reptiles of the Dinosauria. They first appeared during the uh, Triassic period, but about 245 to 233.23 million years ago. Um, although exact origin and timing of the evolution is subject to active research, they became a dominant terrestrial vertebrates after the Triassic Jurassic extinction 201 million years ago. Uh, and their dominance continued throughout the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. Um, the fossil record shows that birds are feathered dinosaurs having evolved from early, earlier theropods during the late Jurassic epoch and are the only dinosaur lineage known to have survived the uh, Cretaceous paleo, uh, Paleogene extinction event, which in other words, it's, it, it should be Cretaceous, uh, paleo, uh, Cretaceous tertiary extinction event, but Paleogene is, is also is, is the same border. Uh, approximately 66 million years ago. Dinosaurs can therefore be divided into avian dinosaurs, birds, and the extinct non-avian. And non-avians were the ones that were killed. All right. The difference between a reptile and a dinosaur, uh, pretty simple. If you notice, reptiles today sprawl. Legs are not underneath them. They're sort of out to the side at a 45 degree, and they more or less pivot back and forth. They don't, can't really, they don't have a lot of round mobility. 
um, uh, a dinosaur and a mammal, we have 90 degree bends in our legs and ball joints. So our legs can move around and they support our weight uh, much, much easier um, uh, as opposed to, you know, this, you're, 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 you're not really fully supporting your weight. You're kind of almost dragging too. Here, we're not doing that. Um, dinosaur family tree. Uh, you got your bird hipped, and then you got your, I mean, your bird hipped, and then you got your lizard hipped. And really, for the most part, it is theropods that are the bird hipped. Um, you know, there are, there is another species. Of, this is sort of up for debate, whether or not this truly exists or not. These might even be in their own class now. It, it, it's interesting. But, um, but the birds and the meat eaters were the theropods, and... Uh, and I guess they're including the sauropods here, but, but everything else was a lizard hipped. Um, and that goes for, you know, your ankylosaurs, your stegosaurs, uh, your, your um, ceratopsia, which is, you know, your triceratops and, and, and what have you. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting um, that the majority of the dinosaurs that we know of, that are especially planties, are all are bird, are all lizard hip. Whereas, with the exception of this, the gigantic sauropods, um, everything else is uh, is um, bird hipped. So anything that's uh, you know here's your lineage. You've you've got uh, you've got sauropods very early. Uh, you got the ceratosauria. Um, you got your allosaurs and, uh, and, uh, Menoptera. These are all meat-eating dinosaurs. So, um, there you go. And then, of course, the birds launched out of that. If you really want to get crazy with it, this is a, uh, family tree of just about everything. Uh, I'm not even going to go through this, but, I mean, here we are. So you can just sort of track yourself down lungfish right and you come right back to here original life you know and, and you can see how we break off and, and what have you but this is your mammals your birds your dinosaurs and, and uh, plants over here and then you, you know you've got this this is just insane that this is beginning and then everything else through time goes over to here uh, there's two splits here um, you know one is for the bacteria uh, archaea and um, what have you, uh, and even plants. Um, but each one of these, basically, it, as, no matter where you go, you're going out in time. So out, 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 out. Um, and as you can see, you know, we go from uh, you know fish to amphibian to reptile to birds to mammals. That is that is the. Uh, and if you really want to start uh, simple, it goes from bacteria, archaea, uh, which are prokaryotes, eukaryotes. Um, you know, you got you got some uh, allergy plants, um, you got your fungus, what have you, and then you know things just diversify from there. And if you want to trace yourself, you can do this here. See, I'm following myself. This I did this twice. Um, I did this for this particular species and this species, and right in here, believe it or not, that is the uh, Dermetrodon, and he's right on our line. And each one of these represents a mass extinction. We made it through one, two. Well, one, two, three, four, five mass extinctions. Speaking of mass extinctions, um, it, it definitely uh, is a good idea to do a quick overview of the big five. In the world of geology, we talk about five uh, large extinctions um, after 540 million years ago. There may have been ones prior to that uh one that killed the uh the ediacaran biota um and then some other uh precambrian life forms um but they're very hard to to really pinpoint because those were soft-bodied animals but in any case there's a few things so um 85 percent of species killed uh, during the ordovician extent uh that was 445 million years ago uh rapid cooling falling sea levels um and essentially killed coastal areas and um, uh, and the cold. Um, so this was probably caused by an ice age. But these are two things that really go hand in hand for um, 
extinction events, rapid cooling and falling sea level. This is going to come up over and over and over. Uh, the Devonian, 340 million years ago. Uh, again, rapid cooling. Um, rapid cooling probably means lowering sea levels too. Um, we suspect an asteroid impact on this. Um, these are the results. Destruction from debris, if it's true, uh, and then ocean life affected by temperature should be cooling. Um, the Permian, this is, this is called the Great Dying. This is the one that really almost took us out. Um, and I do a lecture on this, which I'll going to do in the next month or so. It's a very hard lecture to do, but 95%. Um, uh, we are descendants of that 5% that somehow made it. Um, volcanic activity uh, is, is, an, is, is probably a, a main reason from the Siberian traps. Increased methane and CO2 from the burning of the coal under the Deccan trap, I mean under the, uh, the uh, Siberian traps. Again, uh, the, now this one's rapid warming, so again it's not cooling but warming. So again it's a climate change. Um, oxygen removed from oceans due to the warming. Uh, and then the diversification, uh, desertification. So we had a huge desert that formed as well from Pangaea coming together. Um, the Triassic, uh, this is 200 million years ago. Um, this is uh, a, a, another, this is rapid warming associated with the camp um, uh, complex, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, and probably uh, contributed to the warming of, of, of most of the Mesozoic area. Um, again, you, when you warm the climate, you get desertification of land uh, and, and heat waves. So really, weather may have may have just been what, what took everything out. Um, and then you have the KT uh, extinction event, which is what we're talking about. That is 80% uh, of life, 65 million years ago, uh, volcanic activity, falling sea levels again. Um, and then we have the bonus, the asteroid impact. Um, this one resulted in widespread fires, plants erupted, so that you know plants cannot grow. Uh, probably plankton, uh, basically just shutting down the food, you know, the the the, the basic uh, food chain, and then of course a nuclear winter after the hit. This is a chart of the big five mass extinctions, um, you know, through the through the Phanerozoic, uh, 540 million years ago. You've got the Ordovician, Devonian, Permian, and Triassic, and Cretaceous. This is the one we're talking about. These are life forms that basically, it's just showing you what the, what the percentage of the, the families are around. So in the Cambrian, you know, they lasted up to the Ordovician, Silurian, they kind of phased out, and then they were just pretty much out by the time the Cretaceous came around. Paleozoic, um, Paleozoic is, is, is uh, you know, life before pretty much the, the Permian uh, extinction event. Um, and the Paleozoic life, you know, it definitely come down, but it's 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 hung in there. Um, and then we have um, uh, modern life forms, you know, more advanced stuff, and it rocketed and it kind of went up and down with everything to the Paleozoic. But then after the extinction of it, it absolutely uh, uh, diversified and evolved. So this is the our modern life forms are the ones that really uh, took off after the um, the Permian extinction event. And this is just a number of of, of marine families that are around. Um, it's not, you know, it, it, it it's just gives you an idea of the species, you know, the time that they showed up, their origin, what they're classified as, and how they've made it, made, made out through time. And really up until the Permian, things kind of stayed pretty level for a long time. In other words, there was, wasn't a huge diversification of, of, of new families that came out until after the extinction event of the Permian. And it again continued on and is still climbing today all right the KT extinction event I'm going to end here um, but I'm going to just start I'm going to give you an idea of, of uh, what we're what's going into so there's two possible causes that we think of one is the Chicxulub impact crater right here um, and then the massive flood basalts that were um, poured out over the Indian subcontinent as it moved over the reunion hotspot. And the reality is, is it's probably a combination of two of these. This started showing up at about one or two million years prior to the extinction event or the impact event. Um, and it really started doing some crazy things to the climate. Um, you know, and India was not here. It was cruising across the Indian Ocean as the Indian Ocean was being created and it went over a hot spot called the Reunion Hotspot and it just went ballistic. 
Um, and the amount of eruptions, some of the largest eruptions known on the planet occurred here. And to just give you an idea, um, if you think about uh, just that, you know, those Canadian fires this summer, how they made the, you know, New York City look for, for a week, you know, that's, those are just little fires in, 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 in Canada. This is in the order of millions of times the magnitudes higher, and it really caused a massive amount of issues with the atmosphere uh, and the oceans. Um, it dumped tons of CO2 into the air, uh, and, and when it erupted, the initial eruption probably put about a sulfur in the air, which made the climate cool, and then the greenhouse gases came in right after, and after the cooling, it started to really rise, and so you just had... Every time there was a large eruption, the, the, the climate was just, you know, seesawing back and forth between hot and cold. And when that happens, well, you have um, species don't, you know, some species do well with it, other species do not. Um, you combine this with the fact that sea levels were dropping. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, species were losing their habitat, so, that, so things were already beginning to die. You add massive temperature fluctuations. Um, with this, and then when everything's just going nuts, the last thing you need is a six-mile piece of iron to land in and absolutely decimate everything. Um, and that's kind of what happened. And I will leave that here. Part one complete.